Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to USJR, well, US Japan Research Institute seminars on teaching the Japanese American scales in the United States of America. Uh, this seminar is co hosted with US Japan, JC, US Japan Council, and Katsuichi Uchida, a president of USJR and vice president of ACEDA University in Japan. First, let me introduce USJR. USJR is a non-profit research institute in Washington, D.C. established in uh, April 2009 by Lee Japanese universities and are managed by eight universities, namely Doshia, Keio, Kyoto, Kyushu, Ritzmegan, Tsukuba, University of Tokyo, and Waseda University. USJR is financially supported by this society of both the United States and Japan. The missions of USJR are to promote policy-related research at our member universities, to organize research teams, discuss their research results to a wider community by the medium of English, to nurture young researchers relating US-Japan issues, and to formulate the communities of researchers and policy makers. USA I hold a week long seminar twice a year, in March and September, and occasional seminars once or twice a month here in Washington, DC. We sometimes hold symposiums in Japan. Please visit our website to know the details of our activities. This week, from the last time, Wednesday until today, we held 11 different events, and this is the final event. We have started collaboration with USJC a few years ago and organized several events. For example, last February, together with the Washington Center, 16 students from our member university participate to the Tomodachi Initiative Project, sponsored by USJC. They came to the States and studied, worked jointly with the US students and did a talk region revitalizing project. And some of them came to Japan a bit Tohoku areas last August. I would like to express our sincere appreciation to USJC. This morning, we will have a seminar on teaching the Japanese American experience in the United States and Japan. USJI wanted to organize this seminar for several years. Thanks to Professor Watanabe Okeo University, eventually we are able to have this seminar today. We are very fortunate to have a distinct speakers on this issue. I'm sure today's discussion will produce fruitful and productive results. We are introducing today's moderator, Dr. Jane Yamashiro, visiting scholars, Asia American Studies Center, University of California, Los Angeles, and I have to receive your permission to be videotaped. And this videotape will be open to the public through the internet. So let me introduce Dr. Yamashiro. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming to our panel today on teaching the Japanese American experience in the United States and Japan. Uh, as you uh, may have seen, the, the description of the panel um, highlights a couple of the questions that we wanted to try to address today. Uh, one is, what is the Japanese American experience in the United States? And another is, how is this history taught throughout secondary and higher education classrooms in the United States and Japan? So we are very fortunate today to have academics from both the United States and Japan to talk more about this. Uh, I would like to introduce each of the uh, panelists and, uh, and then uh, we'll hear from them and end with some question and answer. Uh, so first we will have Dr. Curtis Takada Brooks. He is uh, on the faculty of the Asian Pacific American Studies program at uh, Loyola Marymount University. He has a PhD in comparative culture with em an emphasis in cultural anthropology, uh, and it's from the University of California at Irvine. 
Dr. Curtis Takeda Rooks teaches courses on Asian Pacific American ethnic community, mixed race and ethnic identity, critical race, qualitative methods, and systems thinking. This past summer, as a part of the U.S.-Japan Council Tomodachi Initiative, Dr. Brooks led 23 LMU Tomodachi Inoue scholars on a short-term visit to Japan focused on international leadership. Our second presenter will be Dr. Mitchell Maki. He currently serves as Vice Provost of Academic Affairs at California State University, Dominguez Hills. He has a PhD in social work from the University of Southern California, and he is the lead author of the award-winning book, Achieving the Impossible, Impossible Dream, How Japanese Americans Obtained Redress, a detailed case study of the passage of the 1988 Civil Liberties Act. Our final presenter today will be Dr. Yasushi Watanabe. Uh, he is a professor of American Studies at Keio University. His PhD is in social, social anthropology from Harvard. Uh, he has written and edited numerous books and articles on topics such as culture and diplomacy and soft power. Uh, he's also the former executive director of the Japanese Association of American Studies and served as the as a 2008 coordinator of the Japanese American Leadership Delegation, uh, which is co-sponsored by the U.S.-Japan Council and the Japan Foundation. Uh, without further ado, let us begin with our first speaker, Dr. Curtis Takada Rooks. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to uh, welcome you all here and thank you for coming. And in particular, I'd like to thank the U.S.-Japan Research Institute Professor Watanabe for his organization, President uh, Uchida, and uh, Mr. Kobayashi, the manager of the, uh, the institute. I'd um, also like to thank the U.S.-Japan Council and their hand in helping to organize this panel. In particular, I want to uh, give a shout out to Maya Fisher. So. Um, they said that silence was better, golden like our skin. Easier like don't make waves, expedient like horse stalls in deserts. Words, words are better than tears and so I spill them. I kill this, this silence. It's an excerpt from a poem by Janice Mirakatani who honored her grandmother and aunt who spent uh, all too long in the camps during World War II. And it was written during the redress movement that Professor Maki will talk to you about uh, later, but it was about sort of giving voice. When we teach Japanese American studies, um, we teach in the context in the United States of ethnic studies. And in ethnic studies, it uh, takes an interdisciplinary approach to the teaching of the Japanese American experiences in the United States that are grounded in critical race theory, world systems, migration, and political economy analysis, and social historical frameworks. Now, taking this approach forces a focus not only on the external forces and structural conditions, laws, policies, and legal practices that impact the lives of Japanese Americans, but it also requires us to integrate the lives, actions, and agencies, the things that people do to make better their lives, either at the individual level, at the community level, or at the society level. And um, the things that, that, that agency that everyday Japanese Americans do in response to political, social, historical events and challenges. Now, what I'm going to share with you this morning is sort of is to sort of set the table for for the group and, and sort of uh, both understanding the context of which we're, we talk about Japanese and teach Japanese American experience in the United States, and then the others will talk about some specific things, and then we can get to some other things in question and answer. The first disclaimer I'm going to give you though is that I'm going to focus on the U.S. mainland. There's an entire history and understanding of the Japanese American experience in Hawaii that would take a panel in and of itself. Um, and so, and not to want to get uh, um, beat up by Mitch Maki, whose par parents are from Hawaii, um, I needed to make that disclaimer. <laughs> but if we look at sort of the Japanese American experience in the United States in sort of a social historical context, 
we can think about it, I'm going to talk about it in terms of sort of identity and sort of inflection points of identity. So during the ESA period, or the, the, the migration period, the immigrant migration period to the United States, we're talking about this from about 1968, I mean 1868 to about 1924. Um, the, the world, the U.S. that the, the ESA migrated to, the Japanese migrated to, was heavily impacted in their understandings of race by the Civil War and um, um, the ways in which whiteness was defined relative to blackness. That that positioning placed Japanese and other Asians into this non-white other category. And it was really shaped structurally by, 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 by three very important amendments to our Constitution that allow for these places of movement and interaction of what I talked about agencies, being able to challenge uh, the United States and to, to sort of their role, their place, their inclusion, their ability to get them the tasks that they wanted to do. And those would be the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So the 13th Amendment sort of ends slavery, the um, uh, 14th Amendment gives birthright citizenship um, and, and equal protections under the law, and the 15th Amendment is about sort of uh, voting rights. And so those will all play out. But in sort of trying to, America trying to figure out this population of blacks and how they would be incorporated into America during Reconstruction, and of course part of it was failed in, in sort of the ways in which uh, the majority of uh, people sort of pushed back against it. And some of that, that pushback, the ESA were caught up in. And so being defined as, as others, and, and being denied the right to, to naturalize citizenship was a part of that, the sort of understanding defining the whiteness. So when we understand the context of which they were working, what they did was all the more remarkable in establishing communities. We do know that at the turn of the century, around the time of uh, 1906, 1907, during the time of the Gentlemen's Agreement, there, we see this inflection point. The first group that comes over, some may could argue that they were somewhat sojourning in our attitudes, thinking about coming here, being successful, being able to go back to Japan, or coming here to, to make money to send home to assist their families in Japan, all these different pieces, so it's somewhat complex. Uh, Yuji Ichioka gives a, a brilliant analysis of sort of the Issei um, in, his, in, in his, his seminal work on, on the Issei. But when you take a look at, at what happens there with the, with the gentleman's agreement, in which the United States wants to cut off the migration, or the sort of uh, migration or allow the immigration of Japanese to the United States, the Japanese government was able to diplomatically work out something so that, so that in essence, families could be reunited. And so you get the whole, this whole notion of the, the picture bride, which in another time we could get into, but so that was the technology that they used, but absentee marriage is what I usually talk about. And then you, the influx of women and the incredible role that women play on the mainland in the sort of economic stability and the building of community in the United States. This inflection point you see in, 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 their, in their editorials, in their newspapers and things, so they go from being a sojourning to a settlement. This is now going to be, Japanese America will be about the children, the families that will be formed and the children that come with those families. So this next period from around 1906 to 1924 and even to the camps is really about family, about building community, establishing America as that place, staking themselves here. Um, and this sort of carries, again, through 1924 with the 1924 Immigration Act and halts immigration pretty much from Japan until after uh, World War II. Um, and so uh, then you get the camp years um, after the sort of the, the um, 1920, well, 1920 to 1940, they establish the communities, they do well economically, and then you have the World War II breaks out, and we have the camps and the things that happen in camps. So as they come out of the camps, sort of, the next sort of task for Japanese Americans is sort of, you see it sort of in their, their, their settlement patterns as they move back to California, is this really claiming of Americanness, right? They, they, the 442, uh, and 100 um, Regimental Combat Team, the whole notion they come back and they're going to establish themselves as Americans. You begin to see American flags in Buddhist temples. You see Buddhist temples begin to have Dharma school, which, which is parallel to Sunday school. So when your kids are going to school and say, what are you going to do this weekend? Well, I'm going to go to church. Because it's not temple you call it Buddhist church, right? And so all these language shifts to, to sort of claim their Americans while still doing their ethnic practices, building ethnic communities, etc. Right? 
So, so this is really time to sort of claim America as sort of its broad strokes. Come to the, you come to the 60s, in 1968, and the uh, civil rights movement in the 1960s, the Vietnam War, and the, the beginning of the notion of Asian American, and the, uh, uh, the Third World's People Movement and, uh, at uh, San Francisco State University, the establishment of ethnic studies. Now we come in a place where we start to talk about Japanese American. Um, and this is sort of, again, we get another inflection point of identity. Now the young Japanese Americans, the Sansei, and the, uh, the, the younger Nisei are now going to claim not only American, but to be able to say, I am Japanese American. I am going to tell my own stories. I am going to kill this silence. Right? They're going to spill words. And spilling those words, they're going to tell their stories and be agents, and they're going to actively seek to impact how they see themselves, how others see them, and claim their place in academia, and at the same time, social politically in, in the United States. And so during this period, you know, uh, and you see that happening with not only sort of Japanese Americans, but African Americans, with Afro, Afro, Afro American studies, etc. But one of the things that Asian Americans and Japanese Americans can do is that they don't hyphenate Japanese American. Japanese is an adjective of an American, right? So it's, 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 it's clear that that's a real piece of it. What comes out of that, though, is that there becomes a sort of notion of authenticity authenticity or essentializing. And so identity becomes wrapped up that will happen in the, in the 80s in sort of redress, uh, the redress movement that Dr. Maki will talk about. But Japanese identity becomes one or, or becomes understood as one that has this authentic, authenticity or litmus test to it. And that litmus test on the mainland is, were you in camp or did you have a grandparent or parent in camp? And that began to define who was Japanese American. And that sort of holds sway, and we see that in Asian American studies as well, where we are trying to carve out our Americanness. We're not area studies. And in part, we're doing that because we, in ethnic studies, our lived experience as people of those communities becomes integral to the understanding and teaching of that experience. Area studies, anyone can be in area studies, become an expert in an area of the, kind of the world, not to say that that's a bad thing, but we wanted to be distinctive about sort of what it is that we were teaching that was something valuable about the, the emic story, right? That sort of internal story of us telling our story because we have perspectives on the U.S. historical political experience that we can give that are stories that are not being told, right? And, and an understanding, and with that comes a social notion of identity. So that becomes an important and, and driving factor of what research is done, how it's taught, how we see ourselves, how we present ourselves to others. The Japanese American community, however, was challenged almost from the jump in this, in this project because in the 1950s to 1970s, they did have a cohort of immigrants from Japan. People like me, who was born in Japan to a Japanese mother, military brides and their families. A very significant cohort settling in places other than California, on the mainland, and carving out a another type of Japanese American community, Japanese American family, a Japanese American identity. We do have some migration starting to come in the 1960s uh, of, of Japanese nationals, mostly for business and stuff on, on the coast, but this other group. This comes to the forefront by the time we get to the 1990s because during the 70s, the, the notion of the sort of housing dispersal, other sorts of things, Japanese Americans have become, quote, American, sort of in a, in a lot of different ways in terms of how others see them, and some, somewhat how they see themselves. And we get an outmarriage rate that is upwards from 70 to 70 percent right now. And so something like uh, three in every four children who's born now in the Japanese American community is of mixed race. And so to understand, so in the 1990s, it was a crisis period for, for the Japanese American community and its institutions. If the litmus test, if authenticity said you had to have a grandparent or parent who was in camp, that wasn't going to continue to fly. So in 1998, we held a, a Japanese American national uh, conference in, Cal in Los Angeles, California called Ties That Bind. And in that conference, there's an active shift um, or a stated shift, not that it wasn't already happening, an active shift from, from uh, the notion of exclusion. You were Japanese by exclusion, right? You, if, if you had this, 
if you had all Japanese blood, if you had any other things in you, you were excluded. Right? So it was really done that way. So it shifted to being inclusive. If you had a, Jap a drop of Japanese blood, if you were married into a Japanese family, you were part of the Japanese American community. Some of the shift is, is certainly practical in terms of membership and organizations, et cetera, those sorts of things, if we were going to have a community. Um, and in fact, uh, um, I got in huge battles with um, your mentor at, 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 at Harry, Kitano. Harry Kitano, who went to the same church and I. We used to battle all the time over this issue um, because he talked about the, the dilution of the Japanese American community. And I said, no, baby, we're coming. Um, and we've got something to bring and add to that story. And so we would always battle about these things. But what we see, though, and sort of in that was a real acceptance, a real shift in, in that particular moment. For people of mixed race backgrounds, it, would, it was particularly noted because at the beginning of that conference, and I'll end with this, there was a plenary panel, and they were talking about Japanese, Japanese, Japanese American values. And for the first time on a plenary panel like that, in a keynote panel, they had a mixed race person who wasn't talking about mixed race identity. It was talking about Japanese of values, those ties that bind. I was fortunate to be that person. And so it was a really interesting piece. Um, because it shifted how the community saw us and talked about us. Um, and, and since that time, sort of, we've actively worked in some other ways. But to understand, so when you talk about sort of Japanese American experience and teaching this Japanese American experience, you, it, you, almost, you almost have to talk about it at one level, and there's many different layers we can put on this, from this identity notion, sort of these inflections of who it is that are Japanese, what is the community, and who comprises it. Thank you, Dr. Rooks. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Mitchell Maki. And uh, please, don't forget to write down questions uh, that you may have so that we can um, have a lively question and answer discussion. Good morning. Oh, folks, we're having a great time here in Washington, D.C. Good morning, <laughs> Ohio. First of all, I'd like to also extend my gratitude to the U.S.-Japan uh, Research Institute for putting this event together, and also to my colleagues, Professor Yamashiro, Professor Rooks, and Watanabe Sensei for joining me here today. I'm very excited to be here today, and as I came here, I asked myself, why do I tell the Japanese American story? And in response to that, let me share with you a story about my grandmother. You see, if there's any word that would describe the life of my grandmother, that word would have to be hard. She came to this country as a young girl, worked on the plantations in Hawaii at a very young age, got married, and by the time she was 30, she had six children. My grandmother never lived much above the poverty line. And she knew that whatever, whatever hopes and dreams she had for a better tomorrow rested on the shoulders of her children, and of her grandchildren. Now, I don't speak much Japanese, and my grandmother didn't speak much English. In fact, one of my favorite memories of her is of her chasing me around, yelling, Bakatare, Bakatare. <laughs> I used to hear that term so often as a child, I thought it was a term of endearment. <laughs> I thought she was saying, my dear grandson, my dear grandson. <laughs> Later on, I found out what she really was saying. But just because my grandmother didn't speak English and I didn't speak Japanese didn't mean that we couldn't communicate because we had my mother and she would translate. And the message was always the same. Be good. Take care of family. Remember who you are. Remember who you are. So from a very young age, I was encouraged by my grandmother to remember the Japanese American story. And the story that I have dedicated my career to telling is the story of the Japanese American redress movement. It is the story of how a small, disenfranchised community in the 1940s was the victim of the most egregious constitutional violation in this nation's history. Went from saying, shikata ganai, it can't be helped. This is what happens to Japanese in this country to 40 years later, being able to stand before the federal government and say, justice delayed, 
is justice denied. We will not be denied atonement, we will not be denied acknowledgement, and we are deserving of an apology and of redress for what was done to us. And it is the story of the strength of our nation, the United States of America, to recognize the wrong that had been done, and in a very measured and small way, atone for that violation. So as such, it's not just a great Japanese-American story, it is a great American story. And I remember the words of my grandmother, to remember who I am. So come back with me for a moment, as we go back to the 1940s. December 7th, 1941, the nation of Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, a naval installation in the territory of Hawaii, thus thrusting the United States into World War II. Americans of Japanese ancestry wondered what would happen to us. Would we be protected by the Constitution? Because two-thirds of us were American-born, citizens by birth. Or would we be treated like the enemy? We received our answer two months later, when President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which created the underpinnings for the incarceration of over 110,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry into concentration camps across the United States. Japanese Americans lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost their businesses, they lost their opportunity to participate in the mainstream of America. But most of all, what Japanese Americans lost was their sense of place at the American table of citizenship. But out of this horrific period comes also a very heroic story that many of you know, and that's the story of the 442nd. Young Japanese American men, really boys, 18 to 22 years of age, either were drafted or volunteered to serve the United States of America in fighting World War II. They were sent across the globe to Europe to die on battlefields, fighting for liberty and justice, while their own parents were trapped behind barbed wire in the United States. Others would serve in the MIS, the Military Intelligence Service, and go to Japan to serve as translators and interpreters, also while their families were incarcerated behind barbed wire. And there's a story of a young sergeant who served in the 442nd, his name was Kazuo Masuda. And Kazuo Masuda was interviewed one day and asked, why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself in harm's way when your own family is being denied liberty and justice? And Sergeant Masuda's answer, I think, was the answer for many of the Nisei soldiers. And he answered, because this is the only place and the only way I know that my family can have a chance in America. Right or wrong, agree with him or not, Sergeant Masuda understood that in 1943 and 1944, patriotism and loyalty needed to be demonstrated by service in the United States Army. The camps end, and for many years, Japanese Americans did not want to discuss what happened during World War II, what we lost during that period. And I'll give you an example. In 1962 at UCLA, there was a professor named Roger Daniels. And Dr. Daniels held a class where he asked his students to write an autobiography. There were two young Nisei Sosansei students in his class. And they both started off their autobiography by saying, I was born in Los Angeles in 1943. Blah, 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 blah. Professor Daniels calls them into his class the next day and he says, there's a problem with your autobiography. And they looked at him and they say, Professor Daniels, we didn't cheat. How do you cheat on an autobiography? Right? And he said, that's not what I'm talking about. You started off your autobiography by saying, I was born in Los Angeles in 1943. Well, what's wrong with that? Go home and talk to your families. The next day, one of the students did come back and he said, Professor Daniels, I talked to my mom and I talked to my dad and you're right. I was born in 1943, but not in Los Angeles. I was born in Manzanar, California, 
an American concentration camp. The pain, the shame, the wanting to forget was so powerful for some families that they didn't even tell their own children about where they had been born. As Dr. Brooks talks about, the 1960s was a time of change and we had the anti-war movement where young Americans learned how to say, hell no, I won't go. We had the women's movement, we had the civil rights movement, and we had the Asian American studies movement and the ethnic studies movement. And out of that came an awareness that something happened during the 1940s that we need to explore. In the 1970s, we start to get representation in the U.S. Congress. We already had U.S. Senator Danny Noe, and in 1976, we have uh, U.S. Senator Spark Matsunaga, elected from the state of Hawaii. In 1974, we have Norm Mineta, elected to the House of Representatives from uh, San Jose, and in 1978, we had Bob Matsui, both of whom had been in concentration camps, elected to the House of Representatives from Sacramento. So in the 70s, we start to have representation. But still, the Japanese American community was a long ways away from saying that they wanted to fight the fight for redress and reparations. We had one group who said, let it go. That was a long time ago. We want to forget. We don't want to remember the pain. There was another group who said, no, what happened to us was wrong, and we are deserving of an apology, a good, clean apology. Let's not put money attached to it. Let's make sure that people understand this is not about money, but this is about principle. Don't put a price tag on my civil liberties and say you can pay me $20,000 and everything will be all right. A good, clean apology is all that we want. And then the third group, there was a group that said no, what was done to us was wrong, and we are deserving not only of a good, clean apology, but there were monetary losses. And so we need to attach money to that apology. We need to make sure that it is an authentic apology and that real pain is felt by the person saying, I'm sorry. That battle raged on until the 80s, when finally we introduced legislation into the U.S. Uh, House representatives. And it took four years for us to fight that battle and to get it through both the House and through the Senate. And in 1988, we only needed one more person to approve of a presidential apology as well as monetary redress payments to the Japanese American community. And that person was the President of the United States. And at that time, in 1988, it was President Ronald Reagan. And for those of you who remember Ronald Reagan, you remember that he was a very conservative president, a president whose own administration had been fighting against the redress movement throughout his eight years in, in office. So the question was at that point, how do we get such a man to support this piece of legislation? And personally, as I was a part of that redress movement, I thought we had fought the good fight, but we were done, that there was no way that we would get President Reagan to sign on. But for those of you who also remember President Reagan, whether you agree with his policies or not, I think you would agree that he was a great communicator. He had the ability to tell stories to large audiences and to move them. But the opposite was also true of President Reagan. If you could tell him a story that would touch his heart, that would move him, you could have a great advocate on your hands. So the question was, what story could we tell President Ronald Reagan in 1988 that would help him to understand the significance of the legislation that was before him, as well as what was done to Japanese Americans? Well, earlier I told you about Kazuo Masuda, the sergeant who said, this is the only way that I know that my family can have a chance in America. Two weeks after giving that interview, Sergeant Masuda was killed in battle, fighting for his nation, the United States of America. After the war, they sent his, family, his body back to his family, who was now living in Santa Ana, California. And his family wants his body buried in the local cemetery. But the local community says, no, we want no Jap body in our cemetery. Never mind that he was an American citizen. Never mind that he was a decorated war veteran who fought for the United States of America. We want no Jap body 
in our cemetery. The Army realized that this was a great PR fiasco and sends out a contingent of Army officers to have a medal ceremony for the Masuda family. And on that day, there was a young white American captain who said these words to the family of Kazuo Masuda. He said, America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race, but on, I on an ideal. Mr. and Mrs. Masuda, as one member of the American family to another, for what your son Kazuo did, thanks. That young white American captain was Ronald Reagan. And this story was relayed to him now in 1988 as he served as president. And his response was, I remember what the Nisei soldiers did for our nation. Now, of course, there's much more that goes into the story. But on August 10, 1988, Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which granted a federal apology and $20,000 individual monetary reparations to each American who had been affected by the concentration camps of World War II. By signing that, Ronald Reagan demonstrated the strength of the United States of America. And this story is a story that is full of lessons, not only for Japanese Americans, not only for Americans of all races, but I would say for citizens across the globe. And that's why I tell this story. And that's why my grandmother's words ring true in my ears of remembering who I am and telling the story helps others to know that also. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Maki. Our final speaker, last but not least, is Dr. Watanabe, uh, Dr. Yasushi Watanabe from uh, Kyoto University. Thank you very much. Uh, when I was a student, uh, the kind of people I associated with uh, Japanese American uh, Senator Daniel Yobe and uh, Secretary Norman Mineta. But uh, looking back at the 15 years of my teaching at the uh, Cairo University, I realized that uh, I came across with uh, four or five Japanese American students uh, in my seminar. And they are children of uh, uh, Japanese businessmen or Japanese entrepreneurs who migrated to the United States in the 60s, 70s and 80s and they speak perfect Japanese and they know very little about the concentration camp or internment and uh, so they are kind of a, a newcomer Japanese American or so-called Shinrikke and that realized me, uh, makes me realize that how complex and dynamic this whole group of Japanese American uh, community is. And though I'm not the expert on Japanese American uh, itself, uh, I'm really uh, feel honored to be invited to this panel and to think about and learn more about the Japanese Americans. Uh, until two years ago, uh, I had a chance to serve as uh, executive director of the Japanese Association for American Studies. And my principal role was to organize an uh, annual event, uh, something like annual conference and meetings, I mean, selecting papers and uh, putting together panels and symposium. Uh, through this role, I learned uh, quite a lot about which members are working on what theme and which topics are uh, more popular among members and so on. And just for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, American studies in Japan, the Japanese Association for American Studies was established in uh, 1947 by a group of Japanese scholars without any initiative or in interference of the U.S. occupation forces. Interestingly, it's uh, older than the American Studies Association in the United States, uh, which was established in 1951, in the early period of the Cold War. Uh, right now, uh, we have about 1,200 members, and I would say about half of the members are teaching full-time at the uh, universities and some 30 to 40 members are actively engaged in research on Japanese American or the Asian American. So it's one of the popular uh, subjects of study. And each year we have several papers and one session uh, specifically focused upon the Japanese American or Asian American. Uh, we just had a year conference uh, for the first time in Okinawa 
And there were papers, for instance, uh, exploring uh, how the concentration camp of Japanese American affected Mexican communities in Los Angeles, or analyzing the relationship between sewing schools and beauty culture in the uh, in Tokyo before the World War II. And also we had guest speakers from the U.S., including Professor Daryl George Maeda of the University of Colorado Boulder and Professor uh, Amy Sueyoshi of San Francisco uh, State University. Uh, in Japan, we also have the uh, Asian American Literature Association, uh, which was established in 1989, and currently has about 100 members working closely with their counterparts in the U.S. And of course, most American studies scholar have experience uh, spending uh, several years or some years studying and researching in the U.S. So I would say, as far as academic research and professional discourses are concerned, uh, there is a little gap of information between U.S. and Japan. Uh, there are quite a number of Japanese scholars presenting papers on the Japanese American uh, at the American Studies Association in the U.S. or publishing their work in the U.S., of course, in English. But when it comes to teaching, uh, it's a different story. Uh, what is surprising is that the history of Japanese American is hardly taught at the high school uh, in Japan. If you read a Japanese history textbook for high school students, uh, which usually has about 350 pages, you find, that, uh, you find that only one page is spared to describe the Japanese American, mostly up to the Immigration Act of 1924, and just one sentence uh, about the internment, and no description about what happened after the World War II. And if you read a world history textbook for high school students, uh, which is slightly longer, I mean, uh, about uh, 450 pages, you find out only one sentence about the act of 1924, and no single word about the internment, I mean, concentration camp. Uh, but the, the case of Japanese American uh, is still better. Uh, because there is no mentioning of uh, Japanese immigrants to South America at all. So it's quite contrast to history textbook used in the US, uh, which usually uh, deals with uh, internment of Japanese American, along with slavery and discrimination against African Americans, and the slaughter of uh, Native Americans and the expropriation of their land. So what happens is that uh, students enter college virtually uh, with little knowledge about Japanese Americans, uh, at the same time, uh, university resource, resources are limited, and uh, Japanese Americans are not the focus of our identity politics in Japan. So it is difficult to offer a specialized course on Japanese Americans or Asian Americans. And as far as I know, uh, there is no specialized course at the uh, Keio Waseda at the University of Tokyo. Uh, I'm told that uh, today uh, we have uh, 15 PhD students. Uh, from eight university, Japanese university in this audience. And I would say uh, they are lucky if, uh, uh, if they have uh, come, up with, come across with uh, any specialized course on Japanese American or Asian American uh, during their college years or even at the graduate school. Uh, however, uh, students tend to get interested in the subject once they are given some background information on Japanese Americans. Uh, so if you have a seminar course with undergraduates uh, doing American studies or ethnic studies, you usually have one or two students each year uh, who, who uh, pick up Japanese American or Asian American as their research topic for graduation thesis. And some of them continue to pursue the subject in graduate school, and that's why uh, we have a constant supply of experts on Japanese American or Asian American in, in Japan. So, uh, potential interest is there, and that's why I devoted one chapter exclusively to the history of Japanese American uh, in the introductory textbook for uh, college students I edited. Uh, it was written by Professor Eichiro uh, Azuma of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's, it's, it's still short, uh, 25 pages. Uh, maybe too short for the uh, long journey Japanese Americans have taken so far. But uh, by requiring uh, students to read the chapter before class, and the teacher can devote more time in class for providing additional information or doing some uh, uh, discussion among the students. Uh, in my case, I teach uh, introductory course on American studies uh, on my campus. Uh, it consists of 14 sessions, each 90 minutes long. 
and I devote one session to the Japanese American, and usually show a video of TV program uh, produced by NHK, the Japanese Public Broadcasting Service, in 2008. Uh, it features a Japanese American leadership delegation program uh, in 2008, uh, which was co-organized by US Japan Council and the Japan Foundation, and how uh, some 15 Japanese American delegates uh, felt about Japan, by US Japan relations, or their identity as being a Japanese American or Asian American, etc. Uh, it also included interviews with the uh, late Senator uh, Daniel Inoue and Representative Mike Honda and touched upon some negative feelings Japanese in Japan used to have towards Japanese in America, as well as Japanese Americans' historical skepticism about the Japanese government and corporations. Uh, it's, it's very engaging and uh, not tenant for the sleep. Uh, which makes me a little bit jealous about. <laughs> um, as uh, Jane said, I uh, happened to serve as a coordinator of the 2008 delegation uh, on Japan side. The US counterpart was, uh, of course, uh, Irene Hirano. Uh, so I can add some uh, anecdotes to students. And one thing that's uh, about the uh, video is that uh, it deals with a contemporary generation of Japanese Americans, so students can feel much closer to them and are curious about how, how they live today. And certainly there are a couple of uh, educational film materials on Japanese Americans, but they are not only expensive, but also uh, uh, they are a bit outdated, usually ending with the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Uh, so in that sense, the NHK program is very useful. Uh, but even that program is already six years old. So uh, one modest suggestion I can make is to uh, I can make today is to create an educational material that delivering more up to date realities of Japanese Americans and make it accessible on the internet. Uh, students can watch it before coming to class or share it with uh, friends. Uh, going back to my class, uh, after requiring students to read the textbook and also showing the uh, video program. I usually pose a question uh, related to the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. Uh, I would ask my students, uh, if you are a Japanese American and forced into internment camp, uh, do you accept uh, $20,000 each from the US government as a compensation? Or do you prefer to accept the money as an individual or more collectively as a Japanese American as a whole? Or do you accept money even when African Americans have not been compensated yet? Or do you think money cannot be a means of compensation, first of all? And these are uh, very, very difficult questions Japanese Americans tackled with uh, 30 years ago, as we said. Uh, at the same time, these are still very important and interesting questions from a point of view of political philosophy, uh, bearing much relevance to contemporary debates on uh, the question of the apology and the compensation. Uh, so this is one way to motivate students to learn more about uh, the experience of Japanese American. Um, another way uh, to introduce, it, uh, another, another way to motivate students is to introduce uh, the uh, diverse reactions of Japanese American communities to the so-called history problems that Japan has with China and South Korea especially over the so-called comfort women issue with uh, South Korea. Uh, as you know, uh, uh, South uh, Korean-American communities are uh, quite preoccupied with uh, installing the uh, statue of uh, comfort women in New York, uh, California, and Virginia, and so on. And uh, since it's a uh, hot issue uh, widely reported in uh, Japan, many students are curious about how Japanese communities uh, in the U.S. are reacting. And it seems to me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it seems that the, it seems to me that the Japanese Americans communities are less unified on this issue than Korean counterparts. And uh, it provides students with a good opportunity to think about where this difference uh, from Korean counterparts come from and what it means to live as Japanese descent or uh, American. Uh, of course, there are many other ways uh, in which we can motivate students. And uh, another modest suggestion uh, I can make is to start uh, exploring the possibility of collaboration among experts into countries for uh, this purpose. Thank you very much.
very much for your very interesting talks. Um, now I would like to um, share a few comments of my own and then open up the uh, discussion to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, first, uh, a comment uh, and question for um, Dr. Rooks. Um, you, know, you had mentioned that for years you've been involved um, in the community um, and as an academic in you know, Japanese American issues and had seen changes over the years. Uh, in relation to the issue of the, the increasing diversity of the Japanese American community and the exclusion uh, or inclusion of multiracial Japanese Americans, um, often called HAPAs, um, and the increasing, well, arguably increasing transnationality of the Japanese American community with um, post-war migrants. Uh, you know, it, it's become a, a larger question about who is Japanese American and what does it mean to be Japanese American. So I wondered if you had some comments on that. And then maybe I'll just read all my questions. And uh, for Dr. Maki, uh, you talked about uh, you, the uh, internment and, uh, most importantly, the, the redress and reparations movement um, after the internment uh, for Japanese Americans. And uh, your book has been very well received, uh, very, you know, it's very well known as uh, a main source to, to think about you know, this history. And I know that you've talked about this book, uh, given talks, and uh, received awards for the book. Um, and I wonder, in terms of the reception of the book with different audiences, uh, in terms of U.S. audiences, um, if you've had people um, from Japan, uh, specifically in Hawaii versus the mainland, um, if there are any uh, things that you could tell us about how, how the book has been received beyond the specific case of Japanese Americans, and since this uh, uh, panel is about uh, the United States and Japan, if you had any, any thoughts about about those audiences in particular, in comparison. Uh, for Dr. Watanabe, um, you mentioned that uh, your interest in um, studying Japanese Americans partly came out of your own exposure to meeting Japanese Americans and, and realizing the, the diversity of uh, the Japanese American community, and, uh, and how in your work you've been working on uh, curriculum, building curriculum to teach about Japanese Americans and supporting programs like the Japanese American Leadership Delegation that has brought Japanese Americans to Japan. And I wondered if you had some thoughts about the different ways in which Japanese uh, in Japan who are not coming to the United States are learning about Japanese through individual contact and through uh, reading about them uh, and their histories and um, I guess how, how to, I, I guess since the panel is about teaching the Japanese American experience and kind of thinking about uh, Japan as a context for learning about Japanese Americans, sort of differences between classroom learning and uh, meeting actual people, if you had any thoughts about um, pluses and minuses or uh, what kinds of preparation uh, has been helpful before meeting an actual person? You know, of course, this can go beyond this particular case, but um, learning history and then meeting someone who has had that history or claims that history, um, those connections. Uh, and I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll, um, I'll leave it there and then um, maybe give you a chance to, to respond briefly. Um, and then open it up to the audience. Since, since you asked me the first question, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, I think that one of the things that is um, particularly interesting in terms of both teaching and understanding Japanese American experiences that there now needs to be much more attention on the notion of mixed race identity. Um, in part, um, or maybe in full, because it, it makes up a, 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 a large portion of who our communities are. And in doing that, it, it, it allows us to really take a look at the intersections of 
the intersections of the Japanese American community with the other communities in the United States as well as in, uh, internationally because the, the mixedness isn't just with Americans. But I think that what this has, has opened up is, is sort of reflective of what I was saying before. In the 1990s and into the early 2000s, one of the things that happened in ethnic studies was a, a greater concentration on the notion of diasporic studies, the notion of diaspora. And so even among Japanese Americans, or at least academics, um, it wasn't so much focused on simply the American experience, but where did that American experience fit within a larger diaspora, diasporic um, experience? And so the notion of transnational identity becomes one that um, uh, becomes even more salient, um, both as academics, but in people's lived experiences. And so what we begin to see in the Japanese American community is a reconnection with, or a willingness to be reconnected with Japan. Um, because you know, when we were growing up, or when folks were growing up in the 70s and 80s, it's sort of, you, you didn't want to be equated with someone fresh, um, FOB, fresh off the boat, or fre fresh off the plane. So you really sort of, the way you dress, the talk, all those sorts of things. One of the things I find interesting in sort of understanding this and sort of teaching, um, particularly Hapa and his relationship to transnationals, looking at sort of people from my generation, or even the Shin Nisei experience, the, the children who were born to, to the, the new post-war migrants who were born in the United States to Japanese national parents. Now, for many of us who had those Japanese national parents, our Japanese-ness was what we learned at home, right? And particularly if you didn't grow up in California, even if you did, home was Japan. Um, and in a lot of different ways, having that identity and that identification with Japan, whether or not Japan cared about us, right? I mean, it was our feeling about how we felt about Japan, um, was really the, the easy part. It was moving into the Japanese American community, its institutions, et cetera. That was where we actually had to learn and construct a Japanese American identity. Where did we fit in the Japanese American story? And in many cases, we imposed ourselves on the Japanese American community um, and were asked to come in, particularly of uh, the, the Sansei parents who were of mixed race or the Nisei grandparents who couldn't understand their mixed race children. And so for those of us who were older, we gave a lot of talks on mixed race identity, what that meant, what are the struggles, how do we raise this kid, what do we do, what are the, all those different pieces, and it was very important um, to the community. And so we had a practical use on one hand, but then we had this other sort of family use on the other. And so it was really an interesting piece. The thing that, that I come back to though is in sort of understanding um, sort of this notion of identity, transnational identity, but it has to go more than something, who do I think I am? And so for me as an anthropologist, I really look at action and structures and, and those sorts of things. And one of the things that I think that we see evidence of it is in the formation of uh, what was uh, then called, or still does, the Japanese American Leadership Delegation, in which Japanese American leaders since 2000, a group of anywhere from 10 to 14, have been going to Japan, traveling to Japan. Mitch went in 2002, I went in 2004. Um, really solidifying, or for some, for me, solidifying my connection to Japan, for Mitch, probably introducing his connection to Japan. Right? So for those of us who were mixed with, with Japanese national mothers, it was really a going home and, and reconnection and establishing a foothold. And for, for Mitch, it was a rediscovery. And so that story, you know, and, and sort of solidified itself yet again in the formation of the U.S.-Japan Council, whose explicit work is about sort of making the connections in U.S.-Japan relations. But we see it in other places, in the Yosei Basketball, which has an annual group that goes to Japan. And that, that group isn't just about jet basketball prowess. There's an essay writing and interview session that kids have to go through to be selected to that. There's also several different other programs now that are bringing Japanese Americans, that's focused on Japanese American, particularly you, to bring them to Japan to be that next, um, as, as uh, we call it, the next Tomodachi generation, that group that's sort of with the person-to-person uh, relationships with Japan, but you can see that where it used to be an embarrassment, it's now become a source of, yeah, that's me, that source of pride, so. If, if I could expand on that, because I, I, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Brooks talks about, let me share a personal story that I grew up in a city called Monterey Park, California, 
and this is in the 1970s. And back in the 70s, you would have Japanese American communities that were located in, geographically together. Monterey Park, and this is Southern California, Monterey Park and Gardena were the two hot spots for where Japanese American families were. When I was going through school, my class would be about 10% Japanese Americans. And these would be children whose both parents were Japanese American. Most of, uh, I'm Sansei, most of my friends were Sansei, their parents were Nisei, and had been in the camps, and their grandparents had been the immigrants. So the whole uh, typology of Issei, Nisei, and Sansei was very true for me growing up. I still live in Monterey Park, and I, I married a Japanese American woman, so my children are Yonsei, and they go to some of the same schools that I went to. Well, in their eighth grade class, it wasn't 10% Japanese American anymore. There were five Japanese American. We could count them on our hands. Because, and that's reflective of how there really geographically in Los Angeles isn't a community of Japanese Americans anymore. We've moved out and are integrated in cities across the Southland. And of those five Japanese Americans, two of them were my children because I have twins. A third one was a Japanese American whose parents immigrated to the United States after World War II. So she was Shin, Is uh, Shin Nisei, and, and was very much what uh, Curtis described, somebody who was connected to Japan because Japanese was spoken at, at her home, and she understood Japan in a way that I never understood Japanese. The fourth uh, child in that class was Hapa, half Japanese American from the mother's side, and half white American from the father's side. So again, that mixed race identity that Curtis talks about. And the fifth one was actually Korean ethnically who had been adopted by a Japanese American family. So you see that the face of the Japanese American presence in my children's school was so different from the presence of Japanese Americans in my experience just one generation previous. So that's just a personal story that validates everything that you just said. <laughs> Uh, and very quickly, to answer the question about uh, my book about Japanese American Redress starting, and thank you for the very kind words, I'd like to expand that to really, I, I go around talking about the Japanese American Redress story. So it's not about my book, it's about the story of what Japanese Americans were able to do. And primarily I speak about that in the United States, so much of my experience has been teaching this story not only to Japanese Americans, and their, their response oftentimes is, we never knew these stories. The children, the Yonsei, uh, and times the Gosei, you know, this to them is grandpa's story, great grandpa's story, and they didn't hear the stories firsthand. So it was brand new to them. And when I taught this story at UCLA, I remember one student in particular sat in the back, he was Yonsei. He didn't say much throughout the whole quarter that we talked about the story. And at the end, he left me a note and he said, you know, Dr. Baki, thank you for the class. Boy, were we tough. And it, to me, it reflected a change in his understanding of what we as a community had done. The other group is white American students who also hear the story for the very first time. And for many of them who come from backgrounds where this wasn't something they grew up knowing about, it's an awakening to how precious our civil liberties are and how important it is for us to maintain those civil, civil liberties and always be vigilant about these civil liberties. And the third group would be non-Japanese American ethnic students who understand prejudice because they live it day to day. They understand oppression because they live it day to day. And when they hear this story and they see the resolution and they see the strength, more importantly, of a community's willingness to stand up for itself, that's probably the most inspiring part of the story for me, is to see these young students say, we can have a voice also in the United States. Well, um, I just got curious about the uh, 15 Japanese students, uh, Kakehashi Project scholars uh, in this audi audience. Who, who are they? Could you raise your hand? Uh, yeah. Um, how many of you have uh, Japanese? friends. One. 
I'll be your friend. <laughs> We're all friends. <laughs> So, uh, I think that, that will, uh, will optimize this or exemplify the situation in, in, in Japan. It's uh, not easy to come back across, uh, come across with uh, Japanese-American uh, everyday life. And uh, from the reaction paper I gather uh, from my course, one thing I discovered was that uh, the, the people in Japan tend to think that it's easy to understand Japanese-Americans because they are Japanese after all. So we are Japanese and they are Japanese, so uh, we don't have to speak so much. So that's a common feeling. So that's why uh, many Japanese were quite uh, upset in uh, 2007 when House of Representatives passed a resolution uh, criticizing the Japanese government over uh, the comfort women issue. And that resolution was led by Japanese American uh, congressman. Uh, so, uh, we have to realize the diverse uh, background and the sentiments that Japanese Americans have uh, towards Japan and, uh, themselves. You know, in teaching sort of Japanese American, um, one of the things that's really important is the, because uh, I, you know, I, I've, I focus mostly on identity here, but this notion of multiple identities. When we talk about sort of uh, identities, it's, it's easy to centralize sort of nationality, race, et cetera. But when we start to talk about sort of the Japanese American experience, one of the first things I do when I teach a class for, um, in ethnic studies, and particularly Japanese American studies, they have to write a, a, a reflection paper that says, what is race, what is ethnicity, and what is culture? And what roles have they played in my life? For some Japanese Americans, that's a struggle because they've grown up with social economic privilege, right? For the Shingi say, it's a different type of struggle because sometimes it's, it's that sort of uh, fight between breaking away from their parents and trying to establish their own identity and sort of thinking that whatever it is my parents gave me keeps me from being fully engaged in America and being fully, fully um, those things. And so it's interesting to watch them play that, but, that, but then in talking about that and sort of parsing that out and understanding Japanese American history or Japanese experience, they then have to understand that there's this other identity as a pan-Asian, and it's a politically imposed, socially imposed identity in the United States, as we said. You know, when you come to the U.S. as a immigrant, you come from your town, wherever you're from, you step off the plane, now you're Asian American, you're like, what's that? Right? Um, and so there's this, this struggle, so there's this other layer. And then there's this people of color thing, right? Which is even more baffling. Because in America, if you go along with it, if you sort of agree with uh, Beverly Tatum and her work on sort of race, you're grow, you grow up being taught to be white, being taught to want to be white. Part of it's a power issue, part of it's a thing. And it's not a maliciousness for the most part, but it says, as Beverly Tatum says, it's like, if you're in Los Angeles and you breathe the air, you have bad lungs, right? It's just part, uh, part and parcel of it. But there's also the other part of the American culture that allows us to challenge that. But understanding it, so this, this understanding of these multiple identities, that's not even getting to being a son, daughter, your sexual identity, any of those other things, right? But even just sort of situating yourself, and so these intersections of race, these intersections of culture, these intersections of ethnicity, because they're, uh, as an anthropologist, I parse those out, and, and then how gender overlays all of that, and what region of the country, it, it really takes the sort of complex work. Students who are willing to work at that get a lot out of it, because they then understand, as, as Mitch is saying, their story, the that Japanese American story, is part of a larger American story. And part of the things that, that American story that that those at the margins are able to do is to challenge the United States to its promise and purpose. The framers of the Constitution, framers of the country, while they were racist in many respects, had a higher value of fairness. Now, how they defined who was, had access to that fairness was narrow, but it was fairness. And, and making that the cornerstone of what America, this, this sort of experiment would be, this democracy, this experimental democracy would be, in fairness, 
opens the door for others to claim its citizenship, its Americanness, right? So, in, in, in that sense, it's, the, it's people at the margins who are calling us to our, our higher purpose, our higher, higher profile, or as the Jesuits say, our best selves. I'm sorry, I teach at a Jesuit institution. <laughs> the, sort of calling the U.S., and I'm going to use a pun here, U.S. as a nation, U.S. as us, to our best self. It's that promise, and that's what this story allows us to do, is to challenge that, to bring us to that promise. And so, it's not a matter of separating ourselves from, it's under ourselves and understanding ourselves in uniqueness back to the whole. And coming back to the whole, I like to hope that we make ourselves stronger. Okay, um, now I'd like to open up the, open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, yes, I believe there's a microphone. So should I? Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay. This is my first time to speak up in the center of the conference. Um, thank you very. I'm very amazed with this. Um, I have one friend from Hawaii. Uh, he's, um, I think, Sansei. Maybe he's Bryce Kiyoshi, and I bit laughed because Kiyoshi is a very uh, old name for Japanese. But um, well, I have several questions and comments about these things. I'm, uh, the one is that I'm, I really get amazed and very moved with this story. But at the same time, I feel this is the story of America. I mean, the, the difficulty I think about this story is that this is the story of Japanese America. And this is the story of the great, you know, greatness of the United States. But this is not a story for the Japanese society. I mean, this is very sensitive. I, I don't know really this is right, but this shows how great the U.S. is. This shows how the Japanese American, how great the Japanese American is. But this doesn't show the greatness of Japan. I mean, this is kind of, I think this is, you know, controversial issue. But so in that sense, if you, well, the one question I would say is that should this be taught to Japanese? I mean, because this is rather the story of Japanese American and the United States. And it seems to be, we need some reason, or we need some logic to tie this to the Japanese society who is living in Japan. So the one question is, that, do you think this should be taught in Japanese um, education? I mean, not in the education of like university teaching American politics or not so, but it's rather a high school. Do you think this should be taught in high school or junior high school in the way that everyone or majority of people in Japan should know about this history. I, I'll t I mean, I'll take a first shot at that. Um, Japan's population is shrinking. Japan's population has been diverse, although not necessarily recognized. And it will be increasingly diverse, whether it's at the level of bringing in other people to work, or as a level of taking a look at its own population. You know, Abenomics has really put a sort of real emphasis on women coming back into the workforce, staying in the workforce. That's a diverse type of diversity in itself. The Japanese American story, and we didn't get into it as full-fledged as we could in terms of for the community interactions and how sort of integrating Hop and other communities into the Japanese American story. Because it, you know, it sounds nice and neat here, but it was bloody and hard. <laughs> Right? And it continues to be bloody and hard um, because we have our own issues with other co communities of color, whether they're blacks or Latinos, and what we feel like those things are happening. But it, 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 is, it is instructive of a journey that I think, in many respects, is Japanese future, Japan's future. I took 23 students to Japan. They were of mixed back, they were of minority background, predominantly Latinos, African Americans. Asian Pacific Americans, we had one Japanese American, and then uh, two, uh, two Anglo, or actually Jewish kids who were uh, intercultural facilitators. And part of the reason I constructed that group, or wanted that group constructed that way, was because if Japan is going to be a global leader and play at the global stage, they're going to have to be able to be not only uh, accepting, but really comfortable with the changing face of America. 
Our bilateral relationship is probably the most important bilateral relationship in the world. The leadership of our country, politically, in 30 years, will not look like it does today. We won't just have the one guy in the White House. They will be in the Senate and the Congress, in, but more importantly, at the local level. In the cities where you have to be able to get the permits for your companies, in the state houses where you have to be able to get state and local tax breaks, you have got to be able to be comfortable with all of America. The Japanese American story, which is still unfolding, is about that comfort, right? Um, and as you look at the Japanese American community and its own diversity, you know, the, the one group that when he was talking about uh, his, his daughter's, his children's class, there are also folks like my daughter, who my wife's Sansei, my daughter is when you sort of quantum's quarter black, and she has other friends, and they identify as black and ease. And she and then identifies with other kids of mixed black Asian background as Blasian. They they understand and see themselves in these complex ways. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's fun to talk about, but they see themselves in these complex ways. Those kids who can see themselves in complex ways will be the international leaders of tomorrow. If you cannot do that, Sorry, the train left. And if you know anything about trains in Japan, they move on time. <laughs> I, I agree with what Dr. Rook said, but to answer your question even more specifically about the Japanese American redress story, I would agree with you. It is an American story. In that context, in answer to your question of should it be taught, I would say it's not a question of should it be taught, it's a question of how should it be taught. What I, what I often caution my students to think about is that you can't take this story and impose it on another culture and say, therefore, because we did it this way, you need to do it this way. Japan has a very different culture than the United States, a very different history than the United States, and a very different set of values in some respects. But should this be taught to Japanese so that they can understand a different way of seeing the world, a, a comparative uh, analysis of how to address social and political and historical problems, I would definitely say yes. How does it translate to the comfort women issue? That's, that's a thorny issue, you know, and, and I think uh, it would be arrogant of Americans to simply say, we said we're sorry, why can't you? I mean, it's not as simple as that, even though one might believe that, even though one might believe that Japan needs to do something about it, how one approaches that is really the question. Well, I also think that uh, the experience of Japanese Americans should be taught at the, uh, even the high school level, or even the junior high school level, um, because uh, we are globalizing, and the, the role of so-called diaspora communities, whether they're uh, Chinese or Ind Indians, or I mean the India, uh, or, uh, or uh, Koreans, or uh, Japanese, uh, the influence of uh, those diaspora communities getting even more important. So we have to be uh, heightened our awareness of the Japanese living overseas. Um, Actually, we talked about uh, what can be done to increase the level of uh, teaching at the uh, high school or junior high school level. But uh, one sort of conclusion uh, we came up with is that we, it has to do with uh, changing the way entrance examination is done. Uh, it's a long story, but uh, the conclusion is that. <laughs> if I could just add uh, a quick comment as well. Um, I have a number of friends who uh, teach at Japanese universities in American Studies programs and, and, and other programs. And in their courses on the United States, um, they'll teach about the Japanese American experience or in a course about migration or something. And uh, what they've told me is that, what numerous people have told me is that in teaching Japanese students um, about Japanese immigration and um, uh, Japanese experiences of discrimination in other countries, and then, you know, generations down, too. Uh, that it helps Japanese who were born and raised in Japan and have not experienced being a minority to better understand and be able to relate to minority experiences 
So I think that is, is also a very valuable thing. Thank you for the question. Uh, are there other questions? Yes. So I want to thank you for three wonderful presentations. I actually teach Japanese politics at a university in Iowa. And I've arranged a couple of different events about internment and the 442. And I found that students were most touched and moved, and it really spoke to them when they met survivors, when they met those who had those experiences, could talk about it, and could answer questions. And unfortunately, that generation is um, passing away. And um, so how do we hold on to those stories best when we no longer have those who can be telling their personal stories, can be answering questions, can be interacting particularly with the young generation? Thank you for that question, and that's something I struggle with uh, daily, because not only about the 442nd, but certainly anybody who was in a camp during World War II, these folks are at earliest in their 70s, most of them are 80s, most of them have passed away. So we're getting to that point where we're not going to have those first-person voices any longer. Um, one of the things that we do in Los Angeles is videotape. You know, and certainly there is the Denshow project up in Seattle. There is the Go For Broke uh, Hanashi project, which specifically uh, interviews 442 and MIS veterans. So if you're not familiar with, with their work, I'd be happy to pass on that information to you afterwards. Uh, but that is really, with the technology that's available today, one of the ways that we need to capture these voices while they're still available. Uh, as well as record their oral histories and, and write them down in, on paper. I, other than that, I don't have a, a good answer because there's nothing that replaces the first person voice when they're in front of you and are alive and can truly answer your questions and interact with you. Um, in, uh, I think it was Palos Verdes or in Torrance, there was, a, 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 there was actually an AP history class that um, some kids were challenged, and they made a great little documentary. I, the name of it uh, escapes me right now, but I'll, I'll get it and pass it on to the organizers. The um, reason I know is my father-in-law, who was 442nd, um, uh, just spoke on Sunday um, following the movie. So they brought at, at one of the community centers there in, in Los Angeles. But what was interesting about this piece um, is that it's how these high schoolers discover themselves through understanding and researching and interviewing the voices of these Nisei. Um, and again, I said one of the big challenges for uh, Japanese Americans has to do with this sort of, uh, at least for a group of them, is the sort of social economic advantages they have today. And so understanding their selves and their history, you know, going to, to, to Mitch's grandmother's, remember who you are, right? Um, but to just tell them that and to tell them the stories, but I think if we can integrate those into, when we're talking about teaching middle school and high school, engaging the kids and capturing the history of themselves and writing both, and, and you can do that with movie, they do incredible work with poetry, they do incredible work in, in even writing plays, producing plays. Do, um, you know, I use an interdisciplinary approach, so expressive forms are a very, very important part of, of how I teach. Those four sorts of arts, the expressive forms, particularly in the younger ages, is, is vital um, and, and instrumental in having them. But when they capture the voices, the most important thing about it for that group of high school students and other high school kids who watch it, those voices become their voice, right? When I tell my, my daughter a story half the time, it's like, wow, 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 wow. But when she discovers it and it's her story, and um, she's going to write a series of uh, children's books coming up here uh, in the next year, at least that's the plan for her to do that, to sort of look at Latinos, Latina stories and Japanese American stories of the, the movement of the 1960s and put it in a form for children, that becomes their voice and their story, and they own that. You know, uh, I'm sorry, i got to answer again. Uh, Curtis is so right. The Japanese American National Museum uh, had a 
conference in Arkansas uh, a few years ago, five, six years ago, because there were two concentration camps in Arkansas. And as part of that conference, we made a specific effort to reach out to high school students uh, a year in advance to tell the story and so forth. And what came out of that effort was a cohort of students, most of them white Americans, who owned this story afterwards, who got a chance to meet the veterans, got a chance to meet the folks that had been incarcerated in those camps. And because it was in Arkansas, their home state, they felt a part of the ownership of that story. And at the conference, and it was one of the most moving parts of that conference, he had this young, I think he was about 15 or 16 year old white American, Arkan, uh, Ar Arkansan, I guess is, is what, uh, how you say it, stand up in front of a group of mostly ethnically Japanese American uh, folks and say, I am an ambassador for this story. This story will be told by me to as many people as I can tell it to. And in that moment, we knew that this story had gone beyond just our community. It's certainly a story that can be owned by all of us. Okay, uh, I think we may have time for one more question. So either we were crystal clear or baffling. <laughs> <laughs> one more question, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. So, so I teach uh, so sort of like an introduction to uh, United States course at a uh, Japanese university, and I'm even using the, the, the textbook that Professor Watanabe is edited. <laughs> but, I, but I have to uh, admit that I'm actually uh, uh, skipping the chapter. I'm not using the chapter uh, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that was about the Japanese uh, American. And uh, you know, listening to the whole uh, presentation kind of made me realize that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I actually was uh, skipping the like really uh, important subject, but I'm keep uh, you know thinking about the particular like, educational uh, use of you know uh, covering Japanese American uh, in my course, and uh, I maybe you know uh, I would like to hear uh, maybe like a, a like a suggestion uh, from you if I were to actually like design a one session that particular yeah, you know that deal with Japanese American what should the you know uh, the general message be I mean I'm thinking you know uh, maybe we we um, there's like a particular educational use to uh, for covering Japanese American because you know it that's something we we can easily re relate to right we, we think that we share a common values and common culture but hearing uh, some of your talk uh, actually thinks that maybe there may be like some danger to that because there's some complexity uh, there's many different experience that uh, you know each Japanese American has so um, if you have is there anything uh, so um, uh, that I should be cautious about uh, any suggestion <laughs> uh, would be you know highly appreciated Well, it depends. It, it depends on the, what kind of class and uh, uh, what kind of level of the students you are teaching. But uh, it certainly could be a, a very powerful story to say what to deliver. What Jen, what Jen said, what it means to live as a minority uh, in this globalized world, and also as I suggested, uh, it has a uh, for instance the Civil Liberties Act has a very deep philosophical uh, questions. And also, uh, the, uh, I go to Brazil tomorrow, but they, they have uh, about 1.5 million Japanese Americans. And the role of uh, diaspora community is increasing. So if you are more focused on international relations, you can integrate the experience of Japanese American to it. But please use. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Since that is correct, I think there's a, a lot of ways you can use sort of a portion of the Japanese American story. If you're going to teach a class on social movements, then the redress movement is a great one to use as an illustration of larger theoretical social movement constructs, right? Um, if you want to talk about constructs of voice, right, sort of people finding their own voice, being able to sort of add their voice, it can be an illustrative con of that. If you want to talk about sort of issues of struggle and, and, and those sorts of things, the Yisei story is an incredible story, right? Um, so, again, sort of 
I, I think you're right. If you, you, there is a danger of essentializing. But the value of Japanese teaching the Jap a Japanese American story, because in one session you get to teach a story, um, uh, is really, I think there's always this connection, right? Um, real or imagined, that sort, of, that, that sort of notion of seeing someone who looks like me, hearing that story about them allows me to connect to it sometimes in ways that I may not connect to another story, right? In that sense, I think that there's some value in that. Um, and uh, uh, there's this piece, I, I want to share this piece with it's about story and, and story of work connection because I do think there, there are some, some, some important cultural co connections, right? That, that sort of help us sort of clear some of these out. And, and this notion of voice. The sweet smell of shoyu fills the house. The chop chop of the knife sounds loudly in the kitchen. Papa smiles and calls me near. Wash your hands and help me, dear. I rinse the nasubi. Papa cooks gohan. Mama li looks in to lend a hand. Outside, the charcoal burns all firing red. It sizzles as chicken teriyaki and fish hit the grill. White smoke rises, filling the neighborhood with the smell of our food. We sit, tadakimas. We eat, we talk, we laugh. And when we are done, Uh, I believe we have run out of time, so I'd like to um, give one final thanks to all of our panelists and to the sponsors of this panel, uh, the U.S. Japan Research Institute and the U.S. Japan Council, um, and to the organizers, um, and to all of you for coming today. Thank you very much.